Hello, I'm Aziza McGill Allende, and I'm here at William Patterson University with my very special guest, civil rights and women's rights activist Anita Hill. Ms. Hill is also a professor at Braddis University. You may recall that Anita Hill helped to change attitudes about sexual harassment in the workplace when she spoke out against then Supreme Court Justice nominee Clarence Thomas. Today she's here to talk to us about the work she's doing with artist Mark Bradford. Hello, Ms. Hill. Welcome. Hello. Thank you so much Hi. for having me. Thank you for being here. So what inspired your work with Mr. Bradford? Well, Mark Bradford is a phenomenally talented artist whose work is abstract, and I had very little knowledge of him or his art. Uh, but I met him, and I was so moved. I met him at an exhibit. I happened to interview him for the Rose Art Museum on my campus. Mm -hmm. And not only was I impressed with the art itself, the aesthetic, but also the kinds of issues that he was tackling. Um, issues of economic inequalities in poor uh, uh, communities of color, mm -hmm. uh, AIDS throughout the country. And we got into a conversation about the connection between policies and art and the human condition. Okay. And that's how we got started. And the projects have evolved, uh, and now we're working together to restore women's voices in social movements and the progress that we've made toward equality. Do you feel that there are other platforms, like the media, for instance, where some of that, the voices of women can be seen more? Well, absolutely, there continue to be platforms. One of the things that I've learned from Mark as well is that his, uh, his, his, his work transcends media. Uh, it can go from paintings to uh, uh, films, videos. I mean, he's just a, an incredible artist. And, but also, just the entertainment industry itself can do a much better job of having women not only as actors, mm -hmm. but as producers of material as crafters of the stories that are presented on the screen. Um, in fact, I just recently written an op-ed piece about the problem uh, with women being represented in the production of uh, Hollywood films and the uh, and, uh, things that go to into the theater. I haven't, t I haven't tackled television yet, mm -hmm. but um, I think that that's also an area where we need more of our voices. We need more of our interpretations of life stories. Well, that work is extremely exciting, but I want to bring it back a little bit, uh, a, li a little bit, to when you testified against then Supreme Court Clarence Thomas. What are some of the policy changes that you have seen a as a result of your testimony? Well, almost immediately after the hearing, uh, even within months of the hearing, there was a piece of legislation that was, is now called the Civil Rights Act of 1991 that had been debated in both houses of, uh, of the uh, Congress in the U.S., and the Congress, the House of Representatives, as well as the Senate. Uh, President George Herbert Walker Bush had threatened to veto it if it were ever passed. But in the wake of the hearing, because of the energy created around the hearing, mm -hmm. that law was passed and women for the first time were able to recover fully when they had been discriminated against, whether it was harassment or other forms of workplace discrimination. People didn't know that there had been limits on the amount that women could actually get for what they had suffered uh, from discrimination. Um, the policies have evolved over time because some of the policies are really uh, legal doctrine. Uh, the number of cases that uh, the Supreme Court has decided mm -hmm. really sort of quadrupled over the years following the hearings, which means that the law was interpreted in ways that gave people an indication of what they were up against, what they had to prove in order to show, so show sexual harassment. And then I think perhaps in the last few years, the biggest policy changes have been with Title IX and the education amendments to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, and what that has allowed is it's actually uh, 
force. The Department of Education has pushed colleges and universities to establish procedures for sexual harassment and sexual assault on campuses. Uh, it, it was long overdue. The law had been on the books since 1972, Title IX, mm -hmm. but it wasn't until 2011 with the Department of Education policy changes that there was really movement nationwide to make those changes real. So do you think considering the comments that President Trump has made about women, um, will those affect future policy changes or even the ones that we have today? Uh, I think that the comments have an impact in and of themselves. Part of what was happening throughout the decades before 2011, when the uh, Department of Education stepped up, part of what was happening in the workplaces before 1991 was that the public didn't wasn't even aware that sexual harassment mm -hmm. that was something was that was against the law. Yeah. Uh, and what President Trump's comments have done is to normalize it and to say, you know, it really isn't that big a deal. It's just what men do. And to normalize it really diminishes the impact of it. Mm -hmm. It diminishes the illegality of it. And that can be, you know, can be persuasive to a public that just doesn't want to deal with the issues. Uh, but in addition, we have the possibility that the Department of Education under the new secretary mm -hmm. could in fact move back on the policies as interpreted by the Department of Education under President Obama. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a real fear for that. Uh, as a matter of fact, they've already moved away from uh, allowing transgender people to use the bathroom right. of their choice. And so we're already seeing movement that, you know, the, the position that the Obama administration took was that the so-called bathroom bills were prohibited under mm -hmm. Title IX. And what we may be having is, or what we're already seeing is that the Trump administration is pushing back on those protections. So is there anything that you can suggest that the public or even the student bodies can do to help make the policies what they should be? Well, institutions can have those protections without being forced by or getting permission from the federal government. So schools and universities, states can in fact choose to impose those kinds of restrictions on people's access to the bathrooms of their choice. Mm -hmm. um, and we can work locally uh, in our own communities, our home institutions, we can work in our home states. And I think that at least for the time being, that's what every individual can do. But we can also hope that the courts will uh, remedy the situation mm -hmm. and you know, interpret the law as the Obama administration had interpreted. Well, Ms. Hill, I want to personally thank you for all the work that you have done and your bravery in speaking out where it needs to be spoken, where a lot of women don't have a voice. And I really appreciate you coming here to William Patterson and sharing with us all the work that you have done. Well, I thank you for your bravery. <laughs> I think it, you show some everyday bravery to be able to do a show like this. And uh, you're doing a great job, I've seen some of the work that you've done. Thank so you. thank you for having me and giving me a chance to, to talk with you.